Almighty Lord, as your son Jesus Christ prayed for unity among his followers, we come before you today. Just as he desired his disciples to be one, we too seek the same oneness in you and among our churches. Lord, guide us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus, embracing love, forgiveness, and understanding. Strengthen the bonds of our fellowship that we may reflect the unity he so dearly cherished. Help us to remember the words of Ephesians 4.3, striving to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. May our actions and words be a testament to the harmony that Christ desired for his church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Abun Bashmayo Nitka Dashishmoh Tifa Merkutoh Newisubionoh A Kanud Bashmayo Baro. Ablan Lahmut Sunkonan Yo Mono Washbuklan Hobain Wahtohain. A Kanud of Hnash Bakil Hayobain Lota Lan Nisuno Elo Fasula Mimbisho Meto Diroki Merkutu Hayroch Portolo Ola Malmin. Amen. Again, thank you so much, Abuna Anthony. And let me again greet everybody and uh, uh, wish you uh, already we celebrated, but happy Thanksgiving to all of you. And uh, the floor is yours, uh, dear Abuna. Thank you so much, Sayedna. Thank you. So as Sayedna mentioned, um, our topic we're going to speak about tonight is unity. And before we talk about unity, first let's talk about why this is such an important topic. Believe me, just today I had a conversation. We were in our um, our church staff meeting. And usually we start off by everyone just kind of sharing what's going on in their life. You know, how was Thanksgiving week, this and that. And someone told a story about an interaction they had with a person who, non-Orthodox, and they started hearing about these Orthodox things and they were embracing this Orthodoxy and they were like, wow, 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 this is so great. And the saints and things like that. And then someone else shared a story, which apparently was on social media. I, I didn't see it, but about, I guess it was a um, Pentecostal pastor who was in California and he had a gas station and St. Moses the Strong appeared to him and, you know, told him he didn't know he was a saint. He just thought he was just a guy. And he was like, you know, you need to go to this monastery. And he's like, why should I? And he told him, just trust me. And he didn't late, realize until later it was St. Moses who appeared to him. So anyway, we, we started chatting about these stories. But then the interesting thing is when we got to the end of all the stories, the person in the story who was convinced didn't join the Orthodox Church. They stayed in their own church. So then we just started talking about it. And I said, you know what? I meet a lot of people who hear about what I do, hear about orthodoxy, hear about the history, hear about the saints, and like, wow, that's so cool. That's so cool. That's so cool. But then they don't join the church. So we started to discuss why that is. And believe me, okay, I'll just kind of fast forward the conversation for you. I truly believe that the faith that we have is so beautiful, is so precious, is so attractive. Yes, I'm saying that. Orthodoxy is the most attractive thing on the planet. But then why aren't people attracted to it? And that's where we have to say, unfortunately, it's the people. But the faith is beautiful. But sometimes the people push people away from the faith. And the number one area is unity. Okay, which is why Jesus' final prayer Okay, we're going to talk about that tonight. In John chapter 17, Jesus' final speech with his disciples before he was arrested and, and, and killed culminated his final prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus' final prayer, it's in John chapter 17, verse 20 uh, through 23. Okay, Jesus said this. 
He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Okay, pause right there. Jesus said, I do not pray for these alone, but for those who will believe in me through their word. So who are these alone? I do not pray for these alone. That's who? That's the disciples that he's sitting in front of, okay? Garden of Gethsemane. He's praying, 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 and he's saying, God, I pray for this, I pray for this, I pray for this, but I do not pray for these alone, pointing at these 11 guys, but I also pray for those who will believe in me through their word. Who is that? That's me. That's you. Like, I believe in Jesus because of the word handed down to me through the apostles, right? So this is a prayer very specifically for you and for me and for the people in our churches, very specifically. And we always talk about, Jesus, we need you to do this. We need you to do this. We pray for this. We pray for this. Well, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is him now praying something about us. Okay? We say, Jesus, give me this. But here, Jesus' last words is, you guys, can you give me this? Okay, he's praying specifically for us. And then he says, pray for these who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. Okay? Again, what is Jesus praying for me and for the people next to me in church? And for the people in, in, in even in your church and in my church together, between our churches. What is he praying for the whole world? He's saying, for the people who believe in me through their word, they may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. And then here we go. This is now the part that relates to what I said earlier about people loving the faith but not joining the church. That the world may believe that you sent me. Okay? So in other words, what Jesus is saying is, this is mission critical. Our unity together. Sometimes we think of unity as like a, you know what, like be nice to each other, behave, like make mommy and daddy proud. No, 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 no. Based on what Jesus is saying, this is mission critical. Like the whole operation is based on this. That people may believe in you is based on us being unified with each other. And if you think about it, you look in the world today. We have never lived in a more divisive world than we live in today. Any area of life. So it used to be when we were kids. Okay, I know y'all are young people, but back me, yeah, I was, I was, I was born. This is what my kids like to say. I was born in the 1900s. Okay, and I was raised in the 1900s. Okay, so you guys don't know the 1900s, but back in the 1900s, we used to be able to have civil dialogue with each other, politics, and we used to be able to disagree with each other. And you know what? Like it's okay. It's not the end of the world. Now, no, you're either with me or you're against me. You're either right or you're a heathen, a pagan, a devil, okay? Same thing when it comes to churches. Okay, I'm not on social media, but I hear some of the stuff that's on there, and it's like there's no room for discussion. There's a, I disagree with this priest, therefore, he should be excommunicated. Why? What are you disagreeing about? I disagree that the coffee should be here, not here, or that the chair should face this way, not this way. And it's like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing, and this guy, where, 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 where'd it come from? Like the way I say this in our church, okay, if I had to come up with like a, a way to summarize this, I say it this way, that we don't need to see eye to eye in order to walk hand in hand. Let me say that one again. We don't need to see eye to eye on everything. Some things we need to see eye to eye on. We need to see eye to eye on. We believe in one God, God, the Father, the Pontiac, the creator of heaven, earth, all things. Like our faith, that's, but I'm saying we don't need to see eye to eye on everything in order to walk hand in hand. Look at, if you don't believe me, what would it be like if there was a group of people who are very, very different, but they were able to work hand in hand together? Look at the disciples. Okay, you know the disciples. Were the disciples all of similar opinion? Same political background. Same educational background. Same socioeconomic background. I mean, if you think about it, the disciples could not have been more different OK, like sometimes I think about like, you know, we'll go with St. Peter. St. Peter was one of the early adopters. OK, he came when Andrew was, one, was like the first one to come to Jesus. He went and got his brother Peter and said, come and see. So Peter was one of the early guys. So Peter, put yourself in Peter's shoes. Here's Jesus. He's telling me, um, you know, all these things. I've heard good things about him from Andrew. Seems like he's a good guy. It seems like he's going to take the world by storm. You know what? I'm in. 
I'm going to join forces with him. And I feel like, you know, this is going to be a special group of people. He's building an army, a spiritual army. It's going to be a special group of people. And I'm going to get in on the ground floor. Okay, and we're going to take over the Romans and we're going to take back, you know, our faith. And like, this is going to, we're going to start a revolution. Jesus is going to be great. And then Jesus goes out and says, okay, first person we're going to invite after you, we're going to invite Levi, the tax collector, who's Matthew, the gospel writer. And Peter's thinking what? Are you sure you want him? Like, nobody likes that guy. Like, we don't like that guy. And the people that we don't like, don't like that guy. Nobody likes that guy. So Peter's thinking, okay, Jesus, okay, you obviously, you had very good taste. You picked me as the leader. Okay. And then you made a mistake with Levi. No big deal. We'll move on past that. And then Jesus went and got Simon, Simon the Zealot. And for those of you who don't know, Zealot didn't mean just someone who had zeal. Zealot was the name of a political party. So Zealots were anarchists, people who wanted to overthrow the government. So right off the bat, you got Matthew, who is pro-government, Simon, who is anti-government, Simon hates Matthew. Matthew hates Simon. Simon's probably tried to kill Matthew before. Both of them are hated by everybody else. And Peter's thinking to himself, Jesus, what are you doing? Like, wh wh what kind of what kind of bad news bears group? Like, what are, what are you doing here? This is a hodgepodge. And that was just the beginning. And then Jesus gets going with the Samaritan woman. Okay, bring in that lady. And then he brings in Mary Magdalene, the lady with the seven demons. And Peter's like, Jesus, we're like already the weirdest group of people on the planet. Do we need the demon possessed lady to be part of us too? And Je that's that's Jesus. That was Jesus. Everywhere Jesus went, this is an important point. Everywhere Jesus went, he went beyond what people thought was okay. And what what he did is he sought people who were different. And he brought them in and united them in him. And I think he did it on purpose. I don't think it was by accident. I think what Jesus was saying to the whole wide world is that my church, my church will be the most diverse place on the planet, but it will be united in me. And did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that the early church, the early church at a time when the world was more divided, even than it is today, back then it was all class system. So you had, for example, you had masters, and then you had servants. And they were totally separate. All, all through society, servants and masters were never, ever together except one place. There's only one place that a servant and a master would sit side by side. You know where that was? A church. Nowhere else. Nowhere else on the planet in first century world, in the ancient world, did you have men and women being the same in anything. Women were completely <laughs> second class, and even third class, to be honest. But in church, in Christ Jesus, there's no male, no female. Equal in God's eyes. This is revolutionary. Okay, children, that's the other one. You know, children, like today, we're like for the children, the children, the youth, the children. Children back then had no value. Children were worthless. Unless you could add value to like, unless you could work, you really had no value. So they had no, children were, there's a dime a dozen. But Jesus gave honor to the children. So the point here is this, what Jesus is saying is, there's no rich or poor. There's no left or right side of the aisle. There's no classes. With me, everyone is united in me. Okay? And I'll show you a verse here from Isaiah chapter 56, verse 7. It says, my house, this is Old Testament, even before New Testament. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. So what I want us to do real quick here tonight, okay? I want us to take this concept of unity which we've all heard about, we know it's the right thing, but I want to try to make it practical because unity is one of those things that's very easy, excuse me, very easy for us to agree on. No, like if I say we need unity, who's going to be like, no, I believe in division. Like no one's going to say that. We're all going to agree. But how do we turn that into action? Like what can I, how can I make that actionable? So I want to give you three ideas okay mindset shifts it's really a mindset more than anything else three ideas that you can begin to practice okay starting in here that can make a huge difference in our church okay in our churches make a huge difference in the ministry they can make a huge difference most of all none of those things matter as much as one thing huge difference in the heart of, of god because again that is what jesus prayed for and instead of me, like what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to repeat this again at the end. Instead of me saying to Jesus tonight, Jesus, answer my prayer. 
Tonight, I want to say, Jesus, I want to be the answer to your prayer. Okay. Three mindset shifts. They're subtle, but I think they can make a big difference. Okay. So number one, the first one, if you were here in person, I'd make you repeat after me. I like to make people repeat. So repeat after me in your head is that no one can do it alone, not even me. No one can do it alone, not even me. No one can do it alone, not even me. Don't tell me how smart you are. Don't tell me how amazing you are. Don't tell me how charismatic, how brilliant, how whatever it is. No one can do it alone, not even me. Even Jesus didn't try to do it alone. He had helpers. St. Paul had a team everywhere he went. Somehow, there's this idea that we have about how we don't need X. Okay, like I don't know anyone, so I'm just I'm just naming names that I'm just saying right here. That, you know what? We don't need Frank. Frank is extraneous. We don't need Gabby. We can do without her. If Andrew left, oh, well, no sweat. No. Every single person is essential to the body of Christ. And just because, this is important, just because you don't see the value doesn't mean there isn't one. What, what analogy does St. Paul all, often paint? Okay. St. Paul paints this analogy, and we in the church, we use it all the time, that the church is the blank of Christ, is the body of Christ. And St. Paul speaks about that often, okay, in, in 1 Corinthians 12, and he talks about how there are indeed many members, but one body. And he says, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. He's saying that if the eye may not know what's the point of the feet, it doesn't mean it's not needed. It just means you, you're you up here. You don't see what's important down there. You're like, I'm doing all the work here. I'm doing the eyes and I'm looking out. Okay, but the feet have a role. You can't say that. And then he says this part. Okay, listen carefully. This is 1 Corinthians 12, 22. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are, anyone know? Necessary. They are necessary. And I'm telling you, Okay, as someone who, like, my whole life I've given to the church. Yeah, that's all I have. In there. I have my family and my church. That's all I got in this world. There are times, I'm, I'm honest, I'll confess in front of Satan. There are times I look at certain people and say, church would be better off without them. Church is better. I know my life would be better without them. But then I get that verse. And I say, no. Those members which seem to be weaker, they're necessary. God says they're important. Watch this one. I'm Father Anthony, the great Father Anthony. God says to me, that person is just as important to this church as you are. And I'm like, but don't you know God? Don't you know who I am? I'm the guy, microphone, I'm the front, I'm the, the, I'm the guy. And God says to me, I know. But that person is just as important to this church as you are. Deal with it. So let me ask you a question. Are there people in the church that you think Oh, what reference? That was 1 Corinthians 12, 22. Are there people in your church sitting in the pew next to you or in front of you or behind you that you think to yourself, they're not that important here. They don't have much value. They're kind of complainers. I'm not saying everyone is perfect. But what I'm saying is that person is a member of the body just as you are. And just because just because I don't know what the pancreas does, it's what the pancreas do. Get rid of the pancreas. That doesn't do any, any value. Gallbladder. Who cares about a gallbladder? Like, I'm here, I'm hands, I'm fixed. No, I mean, I don't know, but I assume a gallbladder is at some value at some point. So there's people in your church. And I got to be honest, maybe some of us, we have to raise our hands. Maybe that was us. I mean, I know for sure there was a time where I was a member of the church. I added no value, but thankfully somebody saw some value in me and here I am today. So maybe there's people in your church that are the same way. We tend to think that there's my way and then the wrong way. So if someone isn't like my way, doesn't think my way, doesn't agree with my opinion, then they're wrong, get rid of them. But I'm telling you, it's one of the things that I pride myself on here at our church at STSA. If you ever to come in, we are a very diverse group of people. And I speak, I'm speak specifically, we're in Washington, D.C. here. We're a mile away from, from the Pentagon. Okay, so we're right in the heart of it all. Specifically, politically, we are very diverse. And I know we got people. Who are hard on the right core, on the hardcore on the right. Like we got people waving the Trump flags and people that will shoot someone if they see someone waving the Trump flag. But we got them both. And I am very proud of the fact that when we come together on Sundays, even though you see them on all weekend and never agree with anything, in church we're united together. 
because that doesn't matter. What matters is this. And we don't need to walk, we don't need to see eye to eye on politics to walk hand in hand in the church. We don't need to see eye to eye on, on extraneous matters in order to walk hand in hand on the things that matter the most. Okay? So that's number one. Nobody can do it all alone, not even me. No one can do it alone, not even me. Second one. This is hard. Each one's going to get harder. The second one. I will choose to believe the best about others, not assume the worst. Again, I will choose to believe the best about others, not assume the worst. In other words, you're going to have to guess at some point. There's going to be a lot of things that you don't know for a fact. You're going to have to guess. I've made a decision in my life. If I'm going to be wrong, I would rather be wrong on the side of believing the best versus assuming the worst. Like I would rather get up to heaven and God tell me, Father Anthony, you were way too loving. You were way too patient. You were way too understanding. You were way, way, way too uh, giving a people a chance to explain themselves. You were way too much versus him saying the opposite. Versus saying you were too hateful. You were too arrogant. You were too quick to judge. You were so sure that you knew everything about everything. You didn't even give someone a chance to explain. I'm okay with the first option. If I'm going to be wrong on one of the two, I'm okay on the first one. I don't want to be on that second. And I'll give you an example from, from the Bible to show you. First Samuel chapter 17 is a famous passage about David and Goliath. I'm sure you all know the story. David and Goliath. Goliath was this big, scary guy, and he was saying, anyone who beats me, I'd challenge anyone to come down here and beat me. All the Israelites were scared. All the warriors, all the soldiers were scared. They were terrified. David wasn't with them because David was off uh, taking care of the sheep back at his house. And then one day, David's father tells him, I need you to go to your brothers who are over there at, with, at the, the place where Goliath was. I need you to take them their lunch. Okay, they left their lunch at home. Go take them this lunch. Go bring them their food. And when David got there, okay, I'm going to read to you what it says. This is 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 28. Okay, it says, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? David's brother, the oldest brother, sees his younger brother David coming and saying, why did you come down here? Why are we burned with anger? Why did you come down here? Who did you leave the sheep with? And then he says this part, okay? I know, I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. That's tough. You know why? Because David's brother, Eliab, was 1,000% sure that he knew why David was there. And he couldn't have been more wrong. He said, I know that you're conceited. What do we know about David? We know David was the most humble of all the people. David was a king, okay? But David had no problem to sit with the, the sick and the, and, the, and, the, and the handicapped and the people down there. I know how conceited you are and watch this one. It's how wicked your heart is. Oh, Eliab, you could have said anything else, buddy. Why you said how wicked your heart is? And that's the one thing that God said, this is a man whose heart is after my heart. You could have said anything else on the planet. You could have said you're annoying. We'd have given it to you. You could have said that you are uh, not that smart. Okay, maybe. But you said, I know how wicked your heart is. But God said, I know how beautiful your heart is. Imagine if the story ended there. Imagine if David heard what his older brother said and left the scene. Well, I got news for you. What if that happens to us in our churches? What if there's people that we're so sure? Oh, we're sure. We're, we're sure. She's here for the world. She's just here to get a guy. Oh, he's just here because he wants a, a job. Oh, he. How we're so sure. Well, I'm saying if we're going to fulfill Jesus's answer or fulfill Jesus's prayer and be an answer to his prayer, we will choose to assume the best versus believe the worst. We will choose to err on the side of being too believing 
versus being too judgmental. We will go the extra mile and say, you know what? No, I think they meant this. No, it's probably this versus the opposite side and be so quick to judge. Okay. So that's number one was that we will, we know we can't do it alone. No one can do it alone. Not even me. Number two, I will choose to believe the best versus assume the worst. And now the third one, which is kind of encapsulating the other two, but again, it kind of steps it up to the final. I will make Jesus's love my standard. I will make Jesus's love my standard, not my extra credit. I will make Jesus's love my standard, not my extra credit. You know what I mean by that? Like sometimes you talk to someone about love. Like someone will come in confession and say this, this, now. We say, you know what? We should love like, we should love them like Jesus would love. What would Jesus do? Whatever, whatever. And then someone would say, okay, you know what, but Father Anthony, I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Me, meaning like, that's Jesus. I'm not Jesus. Okay. What I want to say to that is, okay, but you know, you're not like him, but you know, he was like you. Like Jesus became man just like me. Jesus was fully human. Jesus walked the same road. Jesus was tempted the way I was tempted. Jesus was stabbed in the back the way I was stabbed in the back. Jesus was betrayed the way, even, actually, I want to say, to be honest, it was in ways that we weren't. Like, tell me what you've walked through that he hasn't walked through. Okay, he's, it says about him that he walked the road as every one of us, except for sin alone. So don't say, I'm not him. Because he became me. He walked this road. And he loved. So what that means is you can choose to do the same. Like, I, I'm not saying you're Jesus and your superpowers, but what I'm saying is that's the standard. That's not like, okay, here we are as humans. And, you know, every now and then I'll, I'll show Jesus love, but er, that's the standard to which we strive in every relationship. It's certainly the standard by which Jesus expected us to, to, to strive towards. And if you don't believe me, go to John chapter 13, verse 34, one of the most important verses in the scripture. This was Jesus' okay, earlier I told you it was like Jesus' final prayer. Well, this is Jesus' final commandment. This is after he had washed the feet of his disciples. He says, A new commandment I give to you, that you also that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. You read that and say, Hey, wait a minute. Jesus, Jesus, why is that a new why commandment? Is, love one another? It doesn't seem like a new commandment. Like, hasn't hadn't he told us about why did Jesus say a new commandment? That you love one another as I also, as I have loved you. Was love a new commandment? Love was not new, but the new part was as I have loved you. Because Jesus started off, you know the golden rule. Okay, the golden rule is love others as you want them to love you. That's the bottom. That's the first thing Jesus said. That's not the last thing he said. That is not the standard in Christianity. That's step one. Okay, that's just. That's just that. That's just eye for eye, tooth for tooth. That's tit for tat. Okay, do unto others you would have them do unto you. That's the bottom. After love others uh, uh, as you want them to love you, step up from that was love your enemy, and we're like, whoa, that's hard. Okay, but that's higher than this. But then actually, Jesus took it to a much higher level, which is love as I have loved you. That's what makes it new. Is 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 the context in which it's given. And again, Jesus didn't give this in the beginning because in the beginning, love as I have loved you. Okay, who are you? What did you What did you do? Five loaves, do fish, walk on water? Okay, big deal. Jesus said, no, no, no. I'm not going to give you this commandment until I've done everything. Until I rolled up my sleeves and washed your feet. And then I give you this commandment. And in case you're still not convinced, stay tuned. This is Thursday night, the Holy Week. Stay tuned because in about 24 hours, you're going to see a new level of love that you didn't even think was possible. Jesus didn't think that love one another was, I'm sorry, was extra credit. He saw it as that's the standard by which we operate. And right after that, he gave that commandment in John 13, 34, the next verse that he gave, now we've come full circle. After he said, love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. John 13, 35, he tells us why it's so important. Now we go back to where we started. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Notice what he did not say. 
He didn't say they'll know you're my disciples if you all know vote for the same candidate. Then they'll know you're my disciples. If you all vote right, you all vote left. That's how everyone will know. How else will they know? Unless they unless you tell them who you're voting for. He didn't say they'll all know that you're my disciples if you all speak the same language or you all think the same way or you all raise your kids the same way or you all like the same football team. He said, no, he said it's the exact opposite. What's going to make them know you're my disciples is that you don't think the same way, yet you're united on this. That you don't vote for the same person, that you don't view the world the same way, that you have different backgrounds, that you have diverse ways of thinking about the world, but you are united by something so much greater, which is me. The unity is in Christ, not in, a, I will say this in our church, what makes us united is not that we're people of common interests. That's a country club. The country club is everyone who comes from this background, who thinks this way, you're united together in that. That's not us. We're rich and we're poor. We're left and we're right. We're New York and we're D.C. Okay, we're cowboys and we're, I was going to say Redskins, we're not Redskins, we're commanders, okay? Can't say Redskins anymore, sorry. Delete that part out. You know what I'm saying? We're Red Sox and Yankees. Okay, we are, we're everything. That's who we are. But we're united in Christ. Because what it shows, think about how powerful this witness is. This is what Jesus is saying. Think how powerful it is. If everything in the world should divide us, yet we say none of this matters because he matters. Think how powerful a witness that is. And maybe, now going back to where I started, maybe those people who believe in orthodoxy but don't join the orthodox church Maybe they're seeing the exact opposite. Maybe that's why they're not joining. Maybe what they're seeing is people saying, if you think like me, and if you talk like me, you raise your kids the way I raise my kids, you agree on everything I agree, then you can be united with us. But that's not what Jesus did. Our unity is so much greater than that. So bottom line. I'll give you one question to ponder for a little bit right here. And I heard this one time I went to a conference for pastors and, 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 and church leaders, and they put something up on that screen. And I'm telling you that, that it was one of the things that messed me up, okay, in my head, is ever since I couldn't get it out of my head. And he said this. He said, imagine a world where people were skeptical about our beliefs, but envious of the way we treated one another. Let me say that one again. Imagine a world where people were skeptical of our beliefs, but envious of the way we treated one another. Said another way, imagine a people, like, hey, I'm just making this stuff up. Imagine that your, your coworkers, your neighbors, your classmates, whatever it is, are like, you know what? You Christians, you Orthodox Christians, y'all are weird. Y'all do weird things. Y'all stay in church for a weird number of hours. Your leaders dress weird. Everything about you is weird. You like sometimes eat food. Sometimes you don't eat food. You have weird menus. But you know what? I hope my daughter marries one of you. Because I see the way the men in your church, I see the way they treat their daughters and their wives. I don't know what you believe. I don't think I believe what you believe. But if my daughter brings home one of your guys, I'd like that. I don't know what you guys do for those long hours in church, but I tell you what, I like it when I hire one of you to work on my team. Your people, okay, your people are, are the best people on my team. I think y'all are crazy. I think y'all are nutso. I think you guys believe in some Santa Claus God or whatever it is. But I like having you around on my team. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Imagine if they said to our church, they said, you guys, Again, I don't understand what you guys do for so many hours, but we're glad you're in our neighborhood. Can you imagine that? It's actually something I always say at STSA is that as our goal, because we now we have a church building, but for the last 12 years, we haven't. So we've moved around a little bit. I said, our goal is that when we leave from one venue to another, is that the people will say, no, don't go. You guys are a blessing to us. The way you guys treat one another, the way you treat us, the way you treat the community, we want you to stay. We don't want to be part of you. Okay, because we're skeptical about your beliefs. But we envy the way you treat one another. That's Jesus' whole point. We talk about our theology and we say, come join us because we are the right ones. Come, 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 come. Oh, that's not the world the world needs. That's not gonna... This preaching never won anyone to the faith. Love is what wins people to the faith. And maybe that's why I'm done after this. 
Maybe that's why Jesus' final prayer was exactly that. It wasn't, Lord, let them be pure. They wouldn't say, Lord, let them not gossip. It wasn't, Lord, let them read their Bible and go to church on Sunday. He didn't pray for that. He said the whole thing, the whole mission, that they may be one. Because if they're one, if they are one, I'm saying this about you guys and about me, about if they are one, we are unstoppable. We're unstoppable. If they are one, this operation cannot lose. But if they're not one, then unfortunately, it can't succeed. So I'll leave you all with that to think about. Jesus' final prayer. No one can do it alone, not even me. Number two, I choose to believe the best versus assume the worst. Then number three, <clears throat> Jesus' love is my standard not my extra credit, okay? If anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Or if Satan has any comments, please feel free. Abuna, thank you very much. I was really blessed to, to be with you today in this uh, Bible study. And it resonates a lot to me because I always tell everybody that uh, it's easy to summarize the whole Bible, if not, I don't want to talk only about the New Testament, but of course, the New Testament is a little bit more in only one word, love. But uh, today I like what, what you, you mentioned and, and you stressed a little bit more as I loved you, you know, as he loved us and he, he paid a heavy price. He died for me, for you, for everybody else. So, and, and this is to me a, a new, even though I'm, I'm a bishop, but it's a new notion or concept of unity. If you pretend to have the whole, of course we have the, the, we have the truth, we are orthodox, but if, if, we, if we say it this way, nobody will come. We have to first, we have to first love everybody, and then we are going to be united together in him in him thank you very much abuna i appreciate yes. your your uh, uh, kindness and uh, whenever i ask you to be with us you are you are here and don't worry i will ask you next year also to be with us at least for one time every season we need you once but now please 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 you can bombard abuna with a lot of questions go ahead don't let him even breathe. Yalla. Start. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate that, Seth. <laughs>